You know, they always say, you learn so much as a student, but you really don't truly learn until you become a teacher. Yes. Because you recognize your blind spots, you recognize your inadequacies, and you become a better leader. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of The Empire Show. This is Bedros Koulian, and we are filming with my man, Sean Thomas, an inside look. And Sean Thomas is the founder of Ask a Millionaire, over a million followers on Instagram, and today he's our guest. He's built and sold a company, and I'm fascinated by that, and I bet you are too if you're building an empire. So Sean, welcome to the studio. Good to be here, man. Good Likewise. Here. Likewise. Thanks for coming. Hey, so um, tell, tell us about the company that you built and sold. And, and, and kind of how it all started. So in 1999, I was selling insurance and I was at this cigar shop and in walks this guy, now to set the tone of the, the, the guy, you know, the point was I always wanted to make a lot of money, we'll get to that, but uh, I meet this guy in a cigar shop in Memphis, Tennessee, where I was living and I was selling insurance. And imagine a pit boss from the 70s, the, in your mind, the used, car salesman cliche, so the short, stocky, mm -hmm. East Coast, slick back hair, mustache, cheap suit, fast five talking. foot seven, yeah. yes, and fast talker. Oh. And he says, hey, Sean, you know, uh, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I sell insurance. He says, do you like it? And I said, it's all right. And he says, uh, how would you like to make $245,820 a year? And I said, 245820 And he says, yeah. And I said, who wouldn't? So this was back in the dial-up stages, so I'll lead to how we got into the business, but it's important to tell the background because that's what we want to learn is how do we actually start businesses? Where do we get the idea, right? So he takes us to lunch and he tells us about this, us? me and the cigar shop owner. Got it. And we go to lunch and he says, um, this is back in the dial-up days, 1999. But this is before high-speed right. internet and, and all of our iPhones right. and laptops and things like that. This was dial-up days. Yeah. He says, I have an idea that I'm, I'm going to put web TV units, kind of like an Apple TV unit. Back in the day, Microsoft had bought this company called Web TV, and it was a little box that. that you could hook up to your TV and a telephone line, and it would let you surf the web through the TV. Pretty novel idea. Right. So anyways, um, he says, we're going to put these in hotels all throughout the world. And he says, I have a relationship with Microsoft to buy the boxes from Philip Magnabox. And he starts throwing out the, what we call you know, the power of association to get people to buy into the dream, right? Here's the power of association. I'm all in. I'm, all I heard was the $245,820. Now, I am curious, Sean, how did he get so specific on that number? Well, he had a system. And he actually showed us exactly how he got to the $245,820. He had a system. And so he says to me, he says, you know, Sean, he says, he says, Here's, the, here's what I need. And this is where I should have used my common sense, but I was young, naive, inexperienced, which I've learned was a great asset, and I still use that, that mindset today. He said, I need somebody who's lily white because I don't have the greatest past in the world. Mm. And that should have been the biggest red flag to stay away from this sure. guy right sure. then. But I was like, I'm lily white. Right, look at me. <laughs> I got what you need, right? Yeah. So he says, I'm gonna sell these to hotels. And the interesting thing where fate would have it was one of the guys that was one of my biggest insurance clients was Indian, uh, Asian Indian. And little did I know at the time that Asian Indians in America own over 50% of the hotels in America. So I call this guy and I say, hey, Vinny, um, I said, let me tell you about this idea of this business that this guy wants to put these, this device into hotels. And he says, oh, my family owns all kinds of hotels. Let's do it. I can just make phone calls and they'll buy the product. So long story short, we get involved in this business and I was the CFO because I was an insurance agent. That would make me a CFO, right? Sure, why not? Of course, you know. Um, and Mike, the guy, Mike, um, have you ever seen the movie Boiler Room? I have. Okay. Remember Ben Affleck in Boiler Room? Yes. Okay, that, those meetings, you just come in, it's not an interview, yeah. you're just coming there and it's really, it's, you're coming to an interview but then you realize it's a business opportunity. Yeah, you're being recruited. We did that for about 12 weeks. We advertised where he said he needed the Lily White. I was the credit card 
and I would put ads on CareerBuilder and Headhunter.net back in the day, mm -hmm. and we would tell people to come to Memphis for a job interview for a potential income of $200,000 a year, XYZ. They would come in, we'd sit them in this really nice boardroom, and Mike would go to town and show them how to make the $245,820. And then he would say, is anybody interested? All the hands would go up after he mentioned Microsoft and Philips and, and the hotels Hilton and Marriott. Everybody's like, oh my God, this is gonna, and this was back in 1999 when all these IT guys were making big bucks, huh. big bucks in technology. Within 12 weeks, we recruited over 120 people as salespeople and 20 people as what we called regional directors, and we sold them territories and brought in over a million dollars of cash to fund this business. Brilliant. Now, all the while, I'm saying, well, when are we going to start selling some product and actually putting it hotels? We're selling the dream, but where's the, oh, you know, shit. where's so you guys the are getting purchase orders. Well, we're getting people to buy into the business opportunity. Got it, and they're not, oh shit, And, the, and, oh, and shit. Mike is selling them on, this works, we have relationship with hotels, we have relationship with the manufacturers. All the while, me and my naivety is going, cool, it's all there. Did no research, did no nothing. Come to find out all of it was basically bullshit. He didn't have a relationship with Philip Magnabas, no relationship with hotels, no relationship with anybody, and had no idea how to truly install these boxes in hotels. So being a problem solver myself, which I know that you believe in being resourceful, I'm, I'm a resourceful person, I call one of my friends and I say, hey, we gotta figure out how to install these things in the hotels because we just sold some to some hotels. Right. We gotta figure out how to install them. So I started learning about Similar to how you became an expert in the fitness industry, I started becoming an expert in hotels, infrastructure. And what I learned first is, is not every hotel, ha they might have a phone in the room, but that doesn't mean that if all 120 people at that Hampton Inn picked up the phone at the same time to make a phone call, that they would get a dial tone. Wow. The hotel would only have actually about 12 telephone lines for all the guests. And they call them POTS lines, plain old telephone lines. Oh, wow. POTS, okay. Right. And so that's where I started learning about technology, the infrastructure of hotels. So real quickly, we learned that that business wasn't going to go anywhere because the guy just didn't have the infrastructure. Mm. We didn't know about hotel budgets. We didn't know what their, pay, you know, what their buying process was. We didn't know anything about the franchise organizations. And it was just a complete cluster. But what I did is I learned about the hotel technology. I learned about the buying process. I developed the relationships and kind of got known as this computer guy. So how did I get into my business? We shut down that company in 2000, 2001 when high-speed internet hit the hit Now the let world. me ask you a question. The, this fellow Mike. Yes. Where, again, in hindsight, you realize the red flag should have gone off when he goes, I need someone Lily White. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he even fessed up and he said, listen, I've got kind of a sketchy past. Yeah. I'm just curious, just as a guy, did you ask him like, hey, what uh, what kind of past do you have? Like, oh yeah, he said he'd gone to jail. He said, yeah, he's yeah, all kinds of stuff, man. So like, was he just a straight up con artist? Straight up con artist. I was so, and I'm telling you, a lot of your audience probably feels this way because they get involved in a lot of these these uh, scams online and things these days. Yeah. I was just so uh, FOMO of success that anything that came my way, I was that guy that yeah. just said, I'm just going to try everything, and you know, 99% of the time, it failed. And I kept wondering why. You know, I kept wondering why. Why, why am I failing at all this stuff? I'm, I'm buying everything when they say that I can make a lot of money doing this. So all I heard was that 245,800, that's all I heard. You know, so while I, while I didn't I, listen to, I, and you know, at that time, I, Bedros, we're, we're privileged today to have guys like you and I talk to the social media audience and yeah. we've been through stuff. We didn't have that back right. in the day. Yeah, you've got I heard no you talk about your creative yeah. letters that you had. and all. That's all we had. We had news, we had hard copy mailed newsletters yeah. that came to us, but we never talked to Zig Ziglar. No. We never talked to Brian Tracy. We never talked to Neural Knight. You know, we, we didn't talk to any of these guys that we were buying their stuff. It wasn't like today. Yeah, it was a one-way conversation. My back parents back. were in the military. Who am I gonna call for advice? I didn't have anybody to call. Yeah. So I just had to go with my yeah. naivety and my gut instinct to try to trust, trust situations, right? And so anyway, so lots of red flags. But here's the thing, you know, and I, I wrote a book called The Power of Naivety after I really tried to determine how I found the success, at least that I found in life, was yeah. I was just naive. But I'm gonna try to answer your question because I know it's a long answer, but the story is, is where it's at is, 
after we ended up shutting down that company, and the reasons we ended up shutting down the company is because dial-up went away and high speed came out. Yeah. And we found out, I found out over time, after we dissolved that company and went bankrupt with that company, um, not personally, I still didn't have any money because I didn't have any money to lose anyways. Um, I decided, or I learned that the hotel industry didn't have a budget to put a computer in every single room. So what I said was, why don't I just put a computer in the lobby of a hotel? Not much expense, and let's just do one at a time and it'll be very inexpensive. So I just started with one hotel. I drove to the hotel and I said, hey, I have this computer I wanna put in your lobby. And they're like, are you crazy? And I said, no, listen, your guests are gonna use this. This was before there were smartphones, before yeah. people were carrying laptops. And that's how the company started. And that was in 2002. By two, and long story, fast forward ahead, 2013, when we sold the company to a private equity group, we got to $20 million in revenue. We had global contracts with companies like Hilton do every single one of their hotels in the world across every flag, and it all started by selling it to just one hotel. And the reason that I was able to start it was by that time, that three years of that 1999 to 2002, I had become an expert on the hotel industry, the buying process, the ownership organizations, the franchise organizations, wow. and I was an expert at computers. And so I was like the authority expert in this arena. So when I talked to them, they knew I knew what I was talking about, and that's how I just drove it home. But ironically, you weren't an expert three years prior. You were from the insurance industry. Exactly. Selling insurance. Exactly. So how, how old were you? Now you're like, where, does we, where do we go with this? This is not, I'm, I've got <laughs> so many go questions to ask you, and I'm gonna ask you in the order that I think our audience <laughs> is gonna most benefit from. One, how old were you when you met Mike? 29. So you're 29, so by the time you're now, dial-up goes away, we get high-speed internet, you're probably 32, 33? 32, 32. Okay, and it's 2002, you're starting your own company. Yep. All right, I get it, one hotel at a time, the logic makes sense, this one works, now you've got this person as a social proof, you go to the next hotel, hey, we're doing it this one, if it worked here, it's gonna work for you. Hey, we're doing it this one, we're doing it, right? Exactly. I got all that. Exactly. But then something, uh, something happens in 2000, late 2007, 2008, the economy crashes, yet you went on to sell your business in 2013 while everyone else was contracting you sold a business, which is almost unheard of in that time. How did you, and I don't even wanna know how you sold yet, we're gonna get there. How did you weather 2007, 2008, 2009? You know, the interesting thing was we had our biggest years in 2008 and 2009 of our entire company. Why? 2008 was the first year that I actually made a million dollars in one year, personally. During the worst times of our economy, I remember being on the news watching this market getting crushed and we're crushing it. And the reason why is, naively, I picked an industry. The hotel industry is really unique. So if you've got somebody watching that is selling to the hotel industry or franchises, you're gonna appreciate this. When you become a brand standard on the budget line of a franchise, mm. it's in the budget, it's there. It doesn't matter really what the economy's doing sure. because they're budgeting it a year in advance at least anyways, and franchise organizations like yourself, you don't put anything in unless you know it's something that your your uh, clients, your customers, whatever you call them, are Franchisees gonna be. Franchisees yeah, No, no, your customers, oh, the guests at the hotel, yeah, that they're user. gonna yeah. wanna use. Yeah. You know, once you put soap in a room, you're not gonna take soap out. Once right. you put, you know, bands in your facility, you're not gonna take them away just yeah. because the economy isn't doing good. True. So one of the things I recognized, what set me apart from my competitors was, I went after the volume play. And you had asked me earlier about, you know, well, that business centers have been around, and, and I'll explain why th the difference of why we had the success we had was I went the volume play, and I went out and struck deals with all of the major organizations to either become an approved vendor, which is the lowest, preferred, which is the next grade, and then mandated vendor. So mm. some of the hotels that we did business with, I struck deals so great with them where we were profitable, but we were ma the mandated vendor. They had, it's That's not, they, they had to use us. Yeah. It wasn't like, hey, you gotta have this computer in the lobby and here, and then go find somebody. It wasn't, here's, you gotta have this computer in the lobby and we recommend these. It's, you gotta have this computer and you gotta use Uniguest. And we had just signed a big deal with Marriott and Choice Hotels right as the economy was collapsing, we had just signed those biggest contracts. Wow. So it was already in the budget. And gotcha. once it's in the budget, it's gotta get done. Think about it today, the company that bought us has gone out there with an acquisition strategy. Those ho if you go into a hotel today, those are still there. Even though now we all use 
phones and laptops that are connected to Wi-Fi mm -hmm. with our own little personal hotspots, those computers are still in the hotel. Because once they get there, it's like they set it and forget it. It's just part of the thing. Yeah, and that was, that was why we crushed it was because that's I had nuts. just signed the biggest deals right before the economy crashed. How much of this was timing well organized on your part versus just sheer luck? I would probably say it was all 100% luck as far as when it happened and, ha and, and where it happened. Yeah. And the reason I say that is I hated living in Memphis, Tennessee. Like, I just didn't like it. If you live in Memphis, I'm really sorry, but I just did not like Memphis, Tennessee. Sure. And I lived there 10 years. Luckily, I start my company in Memphis, Tennessee, and who resides in Memphis, Tennessee? Hilton. So the Embassy Suites, Hilton Garden Inn, Homewood Suites, and Hampton Inn brands reside right there. One of my first clients was the regional director of Hilton, and he put my product in the Embassy Suites Hotel hmm. that all of the corporate bigwigs that would come from Los Angeles and Beverly Hills, the, the bigwig corporates, yeah. would stay at that Embassy Suites to do their meetings with, the, uh, with those franchises. Yeah. So one day, my guy at Embassy Suites says, hey, the big boss came in and we're gonna go after the business travelers with Embassy Suites. We want you to come in and show them what you do at our Embassy Suites because we wanna do it at all of our 450 hotels across America, Wow. the same deal. Wow. And so that just catapulted, I mean, can you plan something like that? No, you just can't plan something like that. You know, I'm really, I'm really grateful that you're being transparent about this because when I started Fit Body Bootcamp as a franchise, it was literally on the heels of the economic crash. You think about one-on-one -on -one personal training is very expensive, right? Six hundred to twelve hundred dollars a month to work with a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer. The economy crashes, and not a lot of people want to work with a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer. Well, at that time, I was coaching and consulting. Well, they want to, they just can't. They want spend to, it. Yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And so, of course, <laughs> if personal trainers aren't getting clients, I'm not getting any coaching clients at that time. Right. And I was so adamantly against the group personal training model, the boot camp model, because in my stubborn head, the model was one-on-one -on -one private personal training. And so, how can we train people in a group? It wasn't until the economy crashed and one of my clients who later became a mentor, Jim Franco, I talk about him in my book, Man Up, said, uh, he goes, hey, you do realize that there's coaches on the NFL field, like one coach to many professional athletes who are like the tip of the spear, and if one coach can train many af athletes who play different positions, don't you think that one coach can train many clients who have one desired goal, which is to burn fat and put on some muscle tone? Right. And he completely changed the way I looked at it in 2008. By 2009, we had launched Fit Body Bootcamp as a franchise model, and that literally saved my house from getting foreclosed because I pivoted from being the business coach to one-on-one -on -one trainers to now I believed in the boot camp model, one on many, and said, hey guys, let's create this, I'm gonna create this franchise, and by 2012 we had franchise and off we went. But it, it, so much of it was luck. A mentor telling me, hey, you're looking at it the wrong way. In 2008 and nine, when the economy crashed, I was lucky enough that personal trainers were suffering, just like I was as their coach, as their business coach, and I said, I think I created a business model here that might make sense. So much of it was luck for me. Strategy comes in later when you decide, how am I going to navigate this to a multi-million dollar brand, right? right. And well, the cool thing, what you just said there that I catch, because I see this is what I do for a yeah. living today, is you said, I was closed-minded about this. Not that you were closed-minded to opportunity or business, which you weren't, but you talked to a mentor yeah. who you respected, who you knew had experience that you didn't have, yeah. and you took his advice. Yeah. You weren't an asshole that just went and just kept asking asshole, for information and, and, and didn't do anything with it. Yeah. You actually learned, and, and I think that that's a, you know one of the most powerful things that a lot of people today aren't utilizing. You know, it's amazing. Even with a million followers on Instagram, the number one thing is I don't have a mentor or anybody to talk to. And I'm like, Bedros has a podcast. Craig has a podcast. Look at all these people that have great information and knowledge. Mm. The only way to get in, you know, there's so much rhetoric. I could go on the whole show about this, but the, oh, so there's so much noise and rhetoric around a lot of the quotes and memes on Instagram today that one of them being, you know, you're the, the average of the five people you hang around. Well, to hang around five guys like you, you're either going to work for you or pay to pay it. It's the, it's the only way, because you, me, and every other you know guy and girl that likes to do this stuff, we'll put out all the knowledge, gen general knowledge that we can. Yeah. But if you want to be in that circle of five people, the only way you're going to do it is to pay or work for us. Yeah. And people aren't most people 
aren't willing to pay for it or come work for us because they're like, no, I want my own thing. Well, are you, can but you do few, your own thing? But the few will. Yeah. Most won't, but the yeah. few will. So I love that you said a mentor told me because yeah. it's just, I think that's probably the most important thing to take away from this is that that one piece of knowledge yeah. changed your whole mindset and kept your business alive. And by the way, since, you know, since then, people still ask me today, well, gee, Baders, do you have any mentors now? Because clearly you know it all. This is when I'm most likely to crash and burn because there's so much at stake now. I have a speaking mentor. I have, uh, I, don't, I don't know if uh, you've heard of the company 1-800-GOT-JUNK, the junk hauling yeah. company, right? Cameron Harold, the CEO of that company, or the former CEO, and he helped build it, I believe, to $200 million before he moved on. He mentors us, actually my second in command, Bryce, our VP. And um, so we have got a speaking mentor. I've got a CEO mentor. I've got mentors coming out my ears because I want all the guidance I can have because the way I look at it is, I look at my mentors as though these are outside eyes who have experience that I don't have in a helicopter looking to see what's coming up in my way and how I can navigate it. Like I'm willing to pay for that, for them to give me the shortcut, to time collapse, to solve the problem, break through the bottleneck. And most people, I believe, don't get a mentor, not because they can't afford it, they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe that once they get the information that they'll act on it mm -hmm. personally. Um, so you, you made it through the economy, and, and I'm curious. Uh, this is, uh, if I was, again, listening to this podcast as someone who subscribes, I go, well, all right, so you were a mandated, like you, you were a mandated product for some of these franchises. So how do you become a mandated product? Do you have to give the franchisor a kickback? Is that like a wink, wink, hey, if you make me mandated, I'll give you a kickback when the franchisees install the computers? Is that how that works? Okay, so no. Yes and no, but it's in a different way. Okay. What I learned was it is a pay, there is a pay to play to get networked with the high level. You know, I never did business with the CEO, who is now Arnie Sorensen. I never did business with him at Marriott. Let's just use Marriott yeah, for an example. Sure. But I did business with the, um, the regional vice presidents of the different brands. And what I learned was in getting in there and networking with the corporate team at corporate office was by sponsoring their annual meetings, their general managers conferences, their owners sure. annual conferences, that the more money I would pay to sponsor, the, the better the table I could sit at and the bigger the booth. So it wasn't, and it wasn't seen as a, as a kickback. It was more portrayed as a, you're going to get time to hobnob with the, right. the, the executives. Yeah. But by showing your support for the organization, you're going to learn more, you know, because not everybody's willing to pay. Like I, I remember I was paying $50,000 a year to a couple conferences and all the other competitors that I had, because a, a lot popped up, yeah. they weren't willing to do that. So, of course, the executives at the, the organizations, they saw that. Of course. They and they're going to give you preferential treatment. I mean, of course, your product has to be good and, you, you know, you have to provide great service. But all, when all things are equal and the competitors are all kind of doing the same thing, who do you think they're going to give the business to? Someone that's supporting right. their organization or somebody that's not? Right. It's the same thing with mentoring and coaching. Yep. If someone is working for me, then I'll mentor them all day long because I want them to succeed in the position and in life which makes them a better employee. Or if, some, if I'm coaching somebody, the more they're paying me, the more divided my, undivided my attention is gonna be. Easy enough. So it was, a, it was the same exact way. Gotcha, gotcha. That, that's great advice because I know there's a lot of people, again, watching and listening to this, and they might think, well, hey, I wanna get in good with this company. Well, if that company or organization has an annual conference, a meetup, an expo, it might be in your best interest to be there and sponsor instead of just sending them a DM I can't tell you how many DMs and private messages I get on Facebook from people saying, hey, I want all Fit Body Bootcamp locations to start offering this exercise band or that kettlebell, right? But when we say, hey, will you sponsor our annual Fit Body Bootcamp World Conference or our gala? Oh, you know, it's not in the budget. Well, if it's not in the budget, if you're not willing to pay and support me, how am I going to mandate exactly. you and pay and support you? Absolutely. It is a pay-to-play model, absolutely. And I see nothing wrong with that. I believe mm -hmm. pay-to-play becomes a filtration process to see who's got the real balls in the business and who's just playing, you know, the, the, the little game. Yeah. I think it's a whole other topic, but... It goes like that for everything. I pay to play today. If I, wanna, if I want to meet somebody, one of the greatest ways that I've learned to meet somebody is to find out where they're donating a dinner at their house for a charity event, because we all do that, yep. and go buy that dinner for 10 grand. And then I'm gonna get a whole night 
with that person and their significant other in their house with wine and food and a private for 10 grand and I'm gonna have alone time. Yeah. And you're gonna build, you know, wine and food and that makes, you know, it's just, you're breaking bread. Yeah. And so it is, it's all about that. It's all a pair play system. If you really wanna elevate and, and get to that next level, that's what I try and teach is you gotta be willing to do that. You know, I'm going to share something with you that Craig Ballantyne and I talk about kind of off camera, and it's just never really made it on camera or onto the podcast, but... Well, let's I, put it on camera. I believe, Sean, <laughs> that food, sex, and money are the ultimate avenues of getting the outcome that you want. And Absolutely. You, and, and you said, you said, hey, you know, if someone's hosting a dinner at their house for some kind of charity event that they believe in, and it's a $10,000 buy-in to co go to that dinner, well, then look what you're doing. You're breaking bread with them in their house, right? And you gave them money. First, we're using Robert Cialdini's, one of his six laws of influence, reciprocity. Right. You gave money, you gave money, they feel indebted now, they have to give you their ear. Exactly. At the very least, they have to hear your pitch. They may not like it, they, you, may, you may deliver a horrible pitch, but at the very least, now they owe you something, they're indebted. So that's a Robert Cialdini, one of his six weapons of influence is, is reciprocity, they owe you. Number two, you're breaking bread. You only break bread with people that you feel safe with, that you trust, and over breaking bread, people put down their guards, they put down their ego, and we see the real humanity. And, and alcohol has a, has a good way of influencing that too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, alcohol <laughs> definitely has a great way of bringing down the guards. So, of course, if you can help someone make a connection, there's been plenty of times where I go, man, I really want to get in good with Sean, let's say, but I don't know what value I can add to Sean's world. But if I can connect Sean with my friend Randy uh, from Scipio and they could do business together, they both own technology businesses, I become that conduit that brought them together. I put money in his pocket and his pocket. So food, sex, and money. And people go, well, what about sex? I'm not saying you ought to go buy a hooker for a person just to, if that's their thing, be my guest. But uh, off camera earlier, we were talking about Frank Kern, a good friend of mine. He's actually like a brother to me. And he was going through a rough time many, many years ago. And um, one of my clients, Natalia, I just had a feeling that they were going to be a good, good pair, and of course I asked Frank to come and speak at my mastermind, and they hit it off. And um, Natalia is now his wife, and they've got three beautiful children and live happily ever after, many trips to uh, Paris. And the difference is that he wasn't introducing a hooker, it was matchmaking. Right, it different. was matchmaking. Yeah, yeah, let's clear that up. <laughs> let's clear, let's, that, let's clear that up. But, but, but the point of this is, like, what can you do to influence someone's you know, sex life or love life or break bread with them? People are, again, are too afraid to go to a conference that Sean is speaking at, and instead of just coming up to you like a fanboy, what if I said, hey, Sean, are you busy? Can I buy you dinner tonight? Mm -hmm. Or if you're having dinner, how about we go to the bar and hang out? Let's have a couple of drinks together. Like, be, be willing to invest via money, via food, via making a connection, introducing them someone to, to, that might be the love of their life. And I believe that's the fastest way to getting to the outcome that you want, assuming that you've got a great product and a great pitch and right. you're gonna add value to that person's life. Absolutely. So let's just walk away from that, that lesson for a moment. You're now... Well, can I, you mind if I... Yeah, yeah, it? yeah, please. You know, one of my mentors is a, is a guy by the name of Tom Black, and he's arguably one of the greatest sales trainers in America. He's been around for a long time, um, toured with Michael Victor Hansen back in the day, and he, in taking a few companies public and finding incredible wealth, like incredible wealth, he became a massive wine collector and became a world-renowned wine collector. And with that has dined with, you know, not only celebrities, but celebr with sh the greatest chefs in the world, the greatest winemakers in the world. I mean, truly drinking with them. Wow. Crazy. So he taught me about what, we, what he is writing a new book called Doing Business at the Table. We're so used to doing business online that when we do meet, a lot of times when people meet us face to face, they don't know how to communicate, right? Yeah. They don't even know how to talk. They know how to talk in short form communication yep. on a DM, but you get them face to face, they don't know about the law of reciprocity and saying, okay, let me ask you questions and get to know you and build rapport and trust so that the law of reciprocity kicks in that if I do that for you, you're gonna do that for me. Yep. And they completely get lost at these having a drink or coffee or lunch or a meal. There's a whole art to that, there truly is. And I've closed some of the biggest deals that I've ever done in my life over a dinner where my mentor said, here, you need to start collecting wine. And you, you know, I asked you, cause you just said you don't drink, so yep. I didn't bring you a bottle. But um, if, if somebody likes wine and you bring a 1982 Bordeaux, or you bring some really special wine that you can explain the history of it and what makes it special, they're gonna remember that. Yeah. 
it, you know, that completely sets you apart from the other 99.9% .9 people. Yep. And then, like I said, you start getting that wine in you, the conversation starts going, and, and so it's part of training. I think that this day in Asia, people should invest in that. Say, that's, a, that's new sales training that people are missing out it on. Is is get off of social media. It's great to learn how to use social media to, to market and what have you, but people are not investing in the training they need to communicate face to face. Dude, you know what's nuts about that, about what you said about how people communicate in short form? I forget if it was Yale or Harvard, but some professor in one of those two universities decided to do some wacky experience, uh, experiment. He, he, uh, he got two, two students, and I believe there were two female students, but the gender he said wouldn't matter. He sat them face to face in front of the class and he says talk get to know each other and it was very awkward hi hi how's it going good he says all right now turn your chairs back backwards now you're back to back take out your iphones here's each other's phone numbers go man they started to communicate emojis and they were able to translate their feelings to one another they were able to share more via texting than face to face. That fine art at doing business at the table, as you described, is missing. And I think that's a massive tool for expediting the outcome that you want. Because listen, if you're DMing me, all I have is the words that go by and I, I might be able to troll your social media and go, all right, this is the vibe I get about Sean. But when you're here three dimensional, as a human, just shaking your hand, I can get a vibe. Just seeing you, right, connecting. If you're asking me if I have kids or not, or, or if I drink wine like you did, I get to learn so much more when we're three-dimensional. And I think, and I know we're going on a tangent here, but I, you, you nailed it. This is such an important point. In fact, so much so that I take my kids, especially my son, to speaking events with me. As I told both my daughter and son, as long as you guys maintain a 3.82 or higher, I'll just take you out on a weekday, take you to a speaking event, because to me, that's another form of education. And my son knows that if I'm on stage and he's in the back of the ballroom, uh, usually where the audio video dudes are, and the next guy's getting mic'd up, doesn't matter who the person is, as soon as they go, hey, who are you? You're not just gonna say I'm Bedros' son and let them go, well, what do you play, young man? What do you do? Right. My son knows the three questions to ask. How do you know my dad? Where do you live? Do you have any kids? And each of those questions, so how do you know my dad? Well, I, we spoke at an event. Oh, what was the event? And he knows yeah. how to build rapport and ask questions because the more you ask about people, the more you get to know them, right? Absolutely. And I know you're skilled at that, but not enough people listening to this episode right now don't have the skill of building rapport. Instead, they start vomiting at the mouth. Hi, my name is Bedros and I do this and I started that and da 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 da. People, it was a Zig Crazy. Ziglar who said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, care. Yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely. Such a powerful lesson. I'm glad you kind of took us down on that segue. Well, think about it. You know, business is about what? Like we were talking, the person, uh, Joan was, was yeah. you know, she's like sales. I'm like, yeah, I love salespeople. Sales yeah. drives everything. Sales drives operations. You know, so I'm seeing, seeing your, work, your workplace here. You talk to all of these entrepreneurs, let's just call them entrepreneurs, they want to be called entrepreneurs, and you ask them, do you have any professional sales training? Have you taken any sales training classes like legit? No. Nothing. How in the world do you expect to be a successful business person and not know how to sell? That just doesn't even make sense to me, like at all. Yeah. Like, and that's because the greatest salespeople, trainers that I know, they're not on social media yet, Harley. They're just starting to break out. There's one that has, but his style is different than my style, but they're just not out there yet. Right. Because they're out there making so much money working for big corporations that will hire them that they're not on social media. So they're not expanding their knowledge base and their, all their nuggets of training to the, to the Instagram audience, the social media audience. So the social media audience doesn't know who to get it from. Right. It's well missing. It it's is missing. And no one's out there seeking it out. And there's a wrong. difference, as you know, because I saw your interview with Frank, there's a difference between marketing and sales. It's completely different. You have to know how to do sales. I just think so many people, so many people miss that. Oh, big time, big time. So take us back to the journey again. Now, 2008, 2009, you weathered that just fine because you were already a line item in the, in the contract for the franchises. Got it, check. But then a few years later, 2013, you sell your company for 20 million, you said? Yeah. You sell your company for 20 million, which is substantial, especially coming out of the economic crash. So first, let me ask you this. How did you even decide you're gonna sell? Did someone come to you? Did you go seek them out? How does this work? Okay. 
back up to 2006. So I started my company in 2002 by myself. Yeah. Um, I proved out the concept to four or five hotels and I had no money. In that previous failed venture, two of the guys from Florida convinced this professional tennis player to give them $200,000 to buy territory of Florida. And the tennis player lost all of his money. Oof. Like lost it all. Yeah. Done. So, I'm, so I, I had a good relationship with these two guys and I knew who this, uh, th this investor was because he was on TV, he was ranked in the top 20. So after I prove out the concept, I call one of the guys that, know, that knows the guy and I said, hey, I want you to introduce me to Jason because I want to ask him to invest in this new right, venture. Right, I know he lost, <laughs> I know he lost $200,000. Right. Go back to the guy yeah. that lost all $200,000. Yeah. Yeah. So How does that conversation so go? He goes, so he goes, all right, I'll introduce you. So I call up Jason, I said, hey Jason, you know, I know that you know who I am, you know a lot about me, I know how much money you've lost. I want to let you know that I have, I have now created the business plan and the model that I, I believe is going to be successful and that I believe that can make back your $200,000. All right, I mean, and it, was, it was at a pure um, excitement um, and desperation of not having any money to grow because I was really broke at this yeah. time. Um, so he goes, well, come down here to Florida to meet with my wife and I and, and we'll meet and talk. So I bring down this, I buy Business Plan Pro online yeah. and, and I, I, pull, I put together this little business plan. I take it down to Florida and I meet with them. And all I was looking for was $25,000. Did you talk about the epitome of naivety? Listen to this. I go down there and I say, hey, listen, I know this is going to be a success so much and I want to protect you you take 51% of the company for 25 grand. Wow. I said, you take 51% of the company. I said, because quite frankly, if we're gonna grow, we're gonna need access to credit and, you, and I don't have good credit, you do, you probably need to own the 51%. So I was forward enough thinking there. Sure. He, get, he, he says, okay, after I leave, go back home. And he says, let me think about it overnight. Calls me the next day and he says, okay, Sean, we're in. So this is a guy that lost $200,000. I'm asking for another 25. As an investor today, if somebody asks me for $25,000, I laugh at them. I go, it's not enough money to do anything. Right. I said, the biggest risk investments out there as an investor are the small dollar amounts, not the big dollar amounts. Right. I'd rather coach you or mentor you and give you $25,000 of coaching, like you were, you were saying, I love that idea, than give you $25,000. Because I know if I give you twenty five, dollars you're going to need what? More. Another twenty five. dollars another, another and another. So I get the $25,000 from Jason, he takes 51%, and I just start building the company. In 2006, I'm about to score this deal with, with um, Embassy Suites, and this is gonna be a million dollar deal. Jason doesn't wanna invest any more money, and I, so, so I approach a guy that I met at a trade show in Memphis that had a, a com company selling to the hotel industry. And I, I called him up and I said, hey, would you be interested in investing in the company? I'm about to close this deal. And I had had a conversation with him previously about being an investor and he turned me down. And funny story is, so you, you don't wanna to listen to everybody that says your idea is not good. And let me tell you why. When I approached him in 2003 and said, would you be interested in partnering or collaborating? He says to me, I don't think computers and lobbies of hotels are gonna be a good business model, Sean. I don't wow. think it's gonna work out. But he said- Imagine if you actually listened to that guy. Exactly. But he did say this, and this is where, like your mentor said to you, change your business model. Mm -hmm. He did say to me, he said, because I was doing an ad-based model at the time. I'll give you the computer for free and I'll sell advertising to local restaurants around your hotel, gotcha. and that's how I'll make my money. This guy says, Sean, here's what I would do. I still don't think it's gonna work, but I would change your business model where you sell the computers to the hotels and charge an annual maintenance contract because computers are going to break down sure. and you need cash flow to hire people. Yep. You know, as your salespeople are doing more, you're hiring more operations, yep. right? So it's the same thing. So I said, okay, I wasn't, you know, uncoachable. So I took his idea, I changed it. So when I called him back in 2006, I said, hey, Mark, it's Sean again. I took your advice. I'm now doing $250,000 in revenue and I'm about to sign a deal with Embassy Suites for a million dollar deal. Do you want in? Wow. So he says, yeah. He says, I will invest $175,000 in your business for 51%. And I'm like, well, I don't have 51%. So I have to call Jason and say, hey, Jason, I need your stock back and Mark's gonna come in at 51%. I'll, I wanna, I'll, have, I'll have 46%. And you'll, and you'll have like 5% or, or uh, 45% or 44% and you'll have 5% yep. and that'll equal, that'll equal 100. And he's like, well, what's in it for me? And I said, well, out of the 175,000 that Mark gives me, I'll give you 100 grand, I'll take 75 and then we'll continue to pay you bonuses you like go. we would as a company. Yeah. 
So 2006, Mark invests in my company. He moves me to Nashville because he has offices like this, you know, and he says, you can just start here and grow. And 2009, we end up having the 50-50 kind of partnership issues, mm -hmm. even though we weren't 50-50. Yeah. And Mark was a great mentor, great person to do business with. He walked me into big hotels. Um, but we started to have a clash of control issues of growth. Yeah. And what I try to tell people, and here's a learning lesson that, fear is not the only thing that's detrimental to business partners and growth. So is greed. So greed and fear both can be very negative because here our company's doing really well and we're clashing heads because I want to just keep crushing it. And he's like, Sean, relax. Enjoy the fruits of your labor. And I'm like, no, man, we got to take, right. we got to capitalize on, on this growth and we got to keep crushing it. And so we, we had a lot of conflict. So we got in a fight. I, I, I said, I want to buy back the company. And he says, all right, give me a million bucks and you can buy back the company. And I didn't have a million dollars personally, but I said, you know what? Let me see if I can get it. So I called the bank, who we had a great banking relationship with. I had a couple hundred thousand dollars that I had saved up by then. Between the bank and my cash, wrote him a check for a million bucks. Literally. How did, how did that feel? It was really crazy. Yeah. You know, I, actually, I, I honestly don't even remember the feeling. We took a picture of it and I posted it on Instagram. Yeah, it was a cool Instagram post. Yeah. But I actually don't even remember how I felt. But, it, but he ended up at the very end saying, well, I actually want to keep 10%. For the, but give me the million. And I was so stupid, I should have said, no, I want 100%. Sure. But I let him keep 10%, and I gave him the million. Now, by that time, Jason had already received all of his $200,000 and doubled, if not tripled, his money. So you made good on that promise. I made good on that. I mean, yeah. he made all of his money back. We're great friends. Like He's like, Sean, you were just like the coolest guy I ever met. That You, you honored your word. You did what you, you said you were going to do. Um, so he made all of his money back, not just the $25,000, but the two hundred. Right. He made all of it back. But to answer your question, when Mark owned the 10%, he had a company, and we were working out of the same building. Mark, the asshole he became... Business partners can be assholes too. Absolutely, we talk about that all the time on the Empire Show. He decides to create a competing product to one of the products that we were taking out. Now let me guess, let me guess, for all of our viewers and listeners, you did not have an operations agreement between you and him that said he wouldn't create a competing product. No, absolutely not. We, had, we didn't even have a non-compete. There you go. Okay, so me being naive and stupid and at this time letting fear take control of the situation instead of getting my own mentors outside of the relationship and what have you is i say well why don't instead of you doing that why don't we just combine our two companies we're both doing about you know i was doing maybe seven million a year in revenue and he was maybe doing six or seven in revenue and i said let's just create a whole new company bring it together your vested interest our shared resources and we'll be 50 50 partners in that Convinced them to do it, and we, and we merged. From the day that we closed that deal, life was hell. But you still gave partners. him that million, right? Oh, I still gave him the million. Yeah. Absolutely. Life was hell. Because that was in 2009. Mm. And 2010 is when we merged. So from 2010, for that year that we merged, was our business was crushing it, making more money than ever. But my life was miserable because every single day, I had to fight him for control issues because he was so egotistical. Hey, listen, I'm egotistical. I'm an entrepreneur. We're all egotistical yep. to some extent. It just is what it is. Um, but we started just fighting. And in 2011, um, we just decided there's no way we're going to get along. And we said, let's just try to buy each other out. But we didn't have a no compete. So we used that over each other's head. And at that time, we had gotten to be so big financially, and we're doing like three to three and a half million dollars of EBITDA, that I said, I can't come up with the money to buy you out. You can't come up with the money to buy me out. Let's just sell it. So we brought in a financial CEO, and he kind of just led the charge, and we went out to private equity groups, strategic buyers, and eventually one company said, we'll do it. And that's okay. why we sold. We sold not because business wasn't doing good. We didn't sell because we wanted to cash out. You wanted a divorce. We literally had to sell yeah. the company because we just didn't want to do yeah. business together. Yeah, life was miserable. It's, it's no different than when people Crazy. build a dream house. So let me draw the visual for all y'all listening and watching this. They'll, they'll build a dream house together. Honey, I love you. We're going to grow old. This is our forever house. We're going to send our kids to college. Whatever it is, I'll say. And then all of a sudden, someone sticks his penis into another vagina that it doesn't belong into. And before you know it, they're divorcing. And part of that divorce is we got to sell this dream house that we built. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so that's what we warn about partnerships. And people go, wait a minute, you and Craig are partners, yet you're warning us about partnerships. Craig and I have such a unique snowflake, unicorn experience. Like, it's such a unique thing together that even though we both own 50-50 in the Empire Mastermind and the Empire Show, we both own work like we own 100% of it. Right. And, and I even say this when Craig is here, and I'm sure he'll hear this episode, but he knows when to yield to me where creativity and marketing this thing is concerned, and I know when to yield to him where structure of the mastermind is concerned, because I'm so busy building the Fit Body Bootcamp franchise empire that I just leave the actual mastermind to him. Right. Like, I trust your judgment on it. We've got a decade of experience together before we ever went into partnerships. So, that's well, you know the interesting thing. thing with that, sorry to cut you off, but the interesting thing is, is you know, you can do so much with operating agreements to really structure things, but you know, I just watched this movie, Quincy. I don't yeah. know if you've watched it no. yet. Okay, it's about Quincy Jones. Amazing, amazing, amazing movie. So influential. And he, he talked about... His daughter is on Parks and Rec, for the record. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's yeah. right. Um, ah. Great show. Um, Quincy Jones, uh, Frank Sinatra is the person that really was instrumental in Quincy Jones becoming as successful as he was, yeah. although he probably would anyways. But he said they did business for X amount of years. I mean, a long time and never once had a written contract. Yeah. Never once. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine line of doing a, a handshake deal. I've had handshake deals that we all yeah. were happy and then I've had, had them go bad and I've had contracts that have gone bad and ones that went good, you know, but I, I'm kind of, Gotten to a point, I, I was listening to one of your episodes, it was with uh, Patrick, yeah. that David, and he was talking about that as you get older and you get more to protect, you do get a little different in your risk analysis yes. of life. Yeah. And I love that part of that segment because I'm not as quick to jump into things now that you have a little bit. Right, um, right. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that is funny how that works. So, so these days, now that you've sold your business, you've, uh, and I believe there's a certain type of person who's just cut from the cloth of service and I must pay it forward. I'm that way, you're that way. Really a lot of people on the social media who are teaching for free. That's what we do, we teach for free, we give for free. Sure, do we have something to gain? Maybe we're, we're gonna be able to take equity in your business if you're a shooting star. Maybe we'll be able to get you as a coaching client or whatever. But at the end of the day, we're creating content for a platform absolutely free because we feel the need to pay it forward and serve. Yeah. Well, free to them because these cameras and these right, lights, yeah, they, they <laughs> yeah. get paid yeah. for. Yeah, we're standing in a, <laughs> an almost a million dollar studio here that we yeah. built out just for this show, yes. and this is all free content we're putting yeah, out. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. But you do something very unique. You you've decided to create a mentorship program where you are paying it forward, and it's called Most Won't I Will. Tell me yeah. about that. So I started on Instagram when I had, I sold my company in 2013, end of 2013, but in 2011 is where I parted ways and said, listen, you guys run the company. I was a CEO, but I'll take off because this is stressing me out. Just keep me on my CEO salary for the next few years until we sell and I'll just leave quietly. I won't make a mess. And so I came out to, I said, I'm going to go out to Manhattan Beach, which is, which is a place that I really love and yeah. I play volleyball and run the strand and, and in 2015, after I had kind of invested in a couple little companies and taken some time off, I was on Instagram. I liked Instagram because I'm a very visual person. And I came across these millionaire accounts, you know, with the Ferraris and the yeah, cash yeah. and all this. But you don't know who runs them. Right. They don't, they don't put their name on them. No. So you don't know if it's a young kid from another country or no. if it's a, a you or me. And I'm going, who in the world are these people? That's not how a millionaire lives their life. Right. <laughs> it's not just that. It's There's not. so much more that goes into it. So it pissed me off. And I'm like, I'm going to create an account. But then I said, okay, I've been in entrepreneurs organization. I've gone through strategic coach coaching program. I've, Dan Sullivan. Yeah, Dan Sullivan. No kidding. I love Absolutely. Dan. You know, I, I've done all these things and I'm like, I'm going to share the real life of the millionaire, but I can't call it millionaire next door. Even though that's kind of my lifestyle is I'm kind of that person. Yeah. Um, I said, I can't call it the millionaire next door. I can't use millionaire mentor because that was taken. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, what is it? And I said, every single time that somebody wants to talk, they just want to ask a millionaire question. And I'm like, I'll just name this thing, ask a millionaire. It's really? pretty simple. Yeah. I'll just name it, ask a millionaire. So I got the dot coms and I did everything that just to make sure in case it turned into something, I had all of it um, from a handle perspective. And then I just basically started posting pictures of myself in, in Manhattan Beach and whatever, and just yeah. doing the captions like we do today. Yeah. And like Gary Vee says, I'm like, I was waking up at five in the morning, grabbing the phone, seeing how many messages I had, and I was answering all the messages. 
Then I'd, I'd take my shower, go walk on the beach, come back, answer questions. Yep. And I did that for literally 18 hours a day for like a long time, a long time. Yep. Then um, the guy that I invested in his company, this first company, he was couch surfing. He stayed at my house. I started mentoring him and he comes home one day and he says, hey, my uh, marketing director found this new application called Periscope that came out and you can actually do what you do without having to write it out. You just turn on the camera and you can talk and answer questions. And I'm like, done. So I, I get on a Periscope and start really um, making a name for myself there and people coming in, it was the Ask a Millionaire show. Yeah. And I would just turn it on and let people ask me questions. And that blew up, Instagram started going well, Instagram Live came out. And then the overarching theme of everything, because I was really trying to teach, the point of the thing was I wanted to teach and wanted people to get real advice and, and really figure from out a how real to, millionaire. from a real millionaire yeah. and know? really how to make yeah. a change in their life. And it was always, you need to get a mentor. You need to get a mentor. And everybody yeah. would then start doing what? Well, I can't afford it. Or, or, or do you want to be my mentor? Yeah, do you want to be my mentor? And I'm, yeah. like, and I'm yeah. like thinking, now here's where you're really going to laugh because I know you think my monthly fee is really low. I would say to people, why don't you just book a call with me? And they'd say, well, how much is it? And I go, I don't know, send me 20 bucks. Send me 10 bucks, send me five bucks. I've had people that would send me five bucks. And I would, I, had, I created a Google voice number, so they didn't have my cell phone, but I would literally talk to somebody for five bucks, 10 bucks. 20, that's how much I really wanted to help sure. somebody else. Sure. So I started developing a, 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 a pattern. There was a big need in this audience for mentors. Outside of social media, business people know to get mentors. There's just some weird thing about the Instagram audience. Yeah. Okay, that they just don't understand to get a mentor and pay for it. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna create a mentorship program because I had a pretty good little following. So I did little polls and surveys. I said, if I start a mentorship group, who, who would join? Yes, 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 yes. I'm like, okay, done. Created a little ClickFunnels page, a little website to take the payment online and did a Facebook group. Nice. After about a year of doing that, I, I then determined, well, I don't know it all. So just like you, me, and any person that's been in business a long time, we develop a network of people. And I said, listen, I, I know how to sell, but I'm not a sales trainer. So I called my friend Tom and I said, hey, Tom, would you come into my Facebook group a couple times a month and answer questions for free? Sure, Sean, for you, I will, right? Hey, uh, uh, Jerry, who owns a multi-million dollar supplement brand, EO member, actually he's in YPO, I mean, doing really well. I said, hey, Jerry, you know about e-commerce and NetSuite and all the things of distribution. Would you come into my mentorship? So I started recruiting all my friends who were much yeah. more expert than me for free to come in and answer questions. Brilliant. So then I increased the fees and man, I'm telling you, it is the, I have learned more. You know, they always say you learn so much as a student, but you really don't truly learn until you become a teacher. Yes because you recognize your blind spots, you recognize your inadequacies, and you become a better leader. True. And so I've learned more kind of just mentoring and teaching than I did the whole time yeah. I was running a business. So how does, how does someone get into your mentorship program? Because I know you, you charge an obscene amount of money for it. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's 48 bucks a month or $480 a year. Stop I know right there. Like, I hear him say, Sean. I charge $40,000 and I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> Sean, stop right there. Did you just say forty-eight dollars a month or forty-eight dollars a minute? Exactly. You said a month. A month. Forty. Folks, that's a about a dollar sixty a day, and I'm not a mathematician, and I could figure that out. And uh, you put people in a Facebook group, and you not only mentor them, but you expose them to some top shelf entrepreneurs who walk the walk, talk the talk, and have learned in the trenches. Absolutely. You know, I, I, because why are you doing this? What's okay. what's in it for you? So the first thing. I'll answer that, but the, the reason that I did this under Ask a Millionaire instead of Sean Thomas was because, A, I, I've learned over time to let my ego go down and yeah. realize that I don't know everything and that there's more power in tribe and, and people than there is just singular. And so when I, when I thought about this mentorship group, the reason I wanted to call it Ask a Millionaire is because I wanted it to be a very diverse group of entrepreneurs. Mm. Because one of your audience members could ask you, what do you, you know, how did you succeed? What's your definition of success? What's the best uh, advice you would give me for this situation? They could ask you, me, and five other millionaires and get five different, completely different responses. True. There's massive power in that. Because then, what we, so what we teach in mentorship is, is I'm not here to tell you what to do. That's coaching. 
Mentorship is, is I'm going to put you up on my shoulders and I'm going to let you see the world from my view and my experiences, and you're going to take the knowledge and then you have to make the decision. That's the difference. A lot of people don't know the difference between mentoring and coaching. Mentoring is I'm going to share experience. So if you say, I'm having a problem with one of my employees, a mentor is going to say, well, in my situation, when I ran to that, I, I did this, this, and this. You take that knowledge and do with it as you want. A coach might say, well, let's sit down and let's create a process in your employee handbook, in your management processes, your review performance techniques, and all these things, and let's set out a, a, a process. That's what a coach does. Mm -hmm. Very different. They're both very valuable, as you and I know, but the reason I did this under Ask a Millionaire is I knew that I could bring Tom and other entrepreneurs that were as successful as me or more, and there's a, a, there are a lot of people that don't want to do what you and I do. You probably have friends that go, what the fuck are you doing on Instagram? I what? Do. I do. Are you serious? You do One all of that? them just recently joined. In fact, uh, Joel Marion about five months ago. A tall guy? Yeah, tall guy, yeah. right? $100 million supplement company. You know, uh, Craig Ballantyne coached him in, in, in his uh, first online business before he created the supplement company. We've been good friends. And he just joined five months ago on Instagram. He's always been a giver of service, but he's like, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? But I have something within me to give to entrepreneurs. Now his giving is more about people making a, an impact with their lives. Right. Like if you've got this life purpose, here's how to go do it. So he doesn't want to teach entrepreneurship. Right. I do because I wish I had someone sooner than when I met Jim Franco, my personal training client who ended up mentoring me, mm -hmm. right? And so I felt like, gosh, I want to be that person to this social media platform, the audience that's out there. Yeah, yeah. but we have friends that just won't do it. Right, so My exactly. most successful, really close friends, they would never do this, yeah. ever. So if we don't do it, who will? You know, we know there's a lot of charlatans, snake oils, salesmen type people yeah. out there. They're, they'll do it, Yep. because they recognize the lost audience that's out there, especially on Instagram. You know, yeah. I hate to say it, but it's just true. And if they don't know they're lost, then they, then, yeah. then they should know. They should learn to recognize if we don't teach them what real business people look like. We, somebody has to be that face. Yeah. But the reason I do this is after I sold my company, I said, hey, I got a choice of either starting another company. I'm already invested in about seven other startups as an angel investor. And I said, you know what, do I want to go back and start another company and put in that grind, the 18, 20 hours like I, like I did? Or there's something to this Ask a Millionaire thing that is developing. So last year I said, let me just give it, I'm going to give this a couple years yeah. and let me see what can happen with it. And this is what's so weird to say, um, Bedros, especially for the audience, is because, yeah, I'm a millionaire and, and I have everything that I want, but even this year, I'll probably do $300,000 of revenue and ask a millionaire because our fees are so low and I haven't advertised. I wanted to just figure out what the business was going to look like. Yeah. And I see people advertise, oh, I'm going to teach you how to make a six-figure business. Fantastic. So even back in the day, my goal was not to be a millionaire. My goal was to make $150,000 a year and work for myself. I forget that that's still a pretty cool thing. That is. But coming off a $20 million business, it's a little humbling. Yeah. It's really humbling. Yeah. And it's been a really kind of humbling experience to go, okay, I'm building something again and learning everything that Craig teaches on his Instagram and all everything that we do. It's been a humbling experience. But I did it because... I do know, and I know you believe in the, in the subscription-based business model as well, that little bit, the reason I charge so little is I want people to be able to have enough money left over instead of me charging them 10 grand, even though I'm 500 a month, I'll go, but I'm gonna get you to some classes. I'm gonna introduce you to guys like you that you should pay 10 grand to, to get coached by. And if I'm charging them $10,000, there's only so much money that they're gonna have when they're first starting out. Sure. So I'm gonna give them the best value that I can for 50 bucks a month. At 5,000, if I get it, you know, if God willing, I get that up to 5,000, that's still a pretty decent right. amount of money. And it's subscription-based, which is what I love about it. Love subscription-based. That's what I learned in my business. The yeah. when, when you get that subscription revenue up over your monthly nut, man, life is great. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I charge so little. Um, but my goal is, is this to be my business. You know, Good this to be you. that business that I don't want to, I don't have aspirations to be a billionaire. I don't have aspirations to, uh, to do anything more than to serve and get real philanthropic. That's my biggest goals is yep. to make some more money to be really philanthropic. Um, but this is my business and I love doing it. That's awesome, man. So if someone wants to get a hold of you, a real life millionaire, like ask a millionaire, where do they find you? 
Well, I want them to pay me by going to. <laughs> 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 uh, so most won't. I will dot com is the website for the tribe. Mm -hmm. And literally the process is they sign, they join, and literally within the next 30 minutes, they're in the Facebook group talking to me. It happens that fast. Wow. Unless I'm here and then my assistant is welcome right. in. But, but literally every single question I see and I answer. So it's, it's, it's not a program. It's real conversation and communication. If they just want to find out about me, just ask a millionaire on Instagram or AKA Sean Thomas is my personal account. Well, Sean, you've given so much, man, and you haven't held anything back. I really appreciate you coming out here. Well, I would, I, there's one thing I wanted to say yes. that we share, that we share that, I, that, that you, you didn't know this, and there's a whole other side as we all do, because I've read all about you, is first off, you don't know that I was probably in a boy band when I was younger. So we get out of here. We get a chance to talk about any of that. People whoa, 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 whoa. People don't know. <laughs> you were in a boy band. So I was in a boy band and traveled with Ringling Brothers Circus for, for a year. So that's a whole other side of my life. That is nuts. We obviously have to have you back. Go on. But you, um, you talked in one of your, your um, who were you talking to? It might have been um, Patrick. And you talked about how when you guys were broke that your dad, you guys would go dumpster diving. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So my, I grew up in a family, a uh, low-income military family. Sure. So my dad, and I didn't even, just like you, it was, it was like talking to myself. You didn't realize that you were fishing through tra trash. Yeah. It was a game. It was, a, yeah. it was just what we did. It's like a scavenger hunt. So my dad would take our family, my older brother and my mom, and we would go to the dump at the Army base on Fort Richardson, Alaska, where we were. And, you know, I'm talking miles of trash, that type of big dump. Yeah. And we would just walk around all day long looking for furniture, food, anything we could that have in the house. That is nuts, man. And so, like, when I look, think back on it, I don't have a negative feeling about it. No. But I always wonder if, if that mentality of... You know, most won't, I will. Most people aren't willing to do what successful people are willing to do and, yeah. and what have you. I, I just think that always just stayed with me was, was what, uh, maybe subconsciously I just recognized that we didn't have. And my dad was showing us that you can't ever not be willing to do those things in order to survive. Yeah. But people like us, we had to go through, and you, I, I know that you went through this psychologically and mentally through your therapy and everything you went through. We had to get out of that stage where we allowed ourselves to feel okay with the success. Right. You know, there's a lot of people like us that come from our backgrounds that we go through a really bad emotional stage, which a lot of people might, might go out and do the excess drinking, partying buying of this and buying of that and look at me, look at me, or it could go lots of other ways. But at some point for us to get to that next level, we have to get professionals to help us right. get through it. But I always look back and think, you know, that we have that common interest that we probably have found success and you're much more, you know, um, business savvy than I am, but it's probably because we were, we were raised that way. Dude, isn't that nuts though? Just the fact that when you think about when you were young and your dad takes you to the dump, and you guys were walking around looking for furniture or what have you to take back to the house. It's that ability to be resourceful that when you started getting into business and your business partner's like, hey, I need a million dollars for you to buy me out of your life. You're like, hold on, let me go figure it out. Again, you didn't have the resources. Right. You only had a couple hundred thousand in your bank account, but you started going to the dump, if you will, looking for resources exactly. and you found it yeah. to be able to get them out of your life. Exactly. All the lessons of suffering and adversity from our childhoods carry into our adulthood. Not enough people want to look back and show gratitude towards that. I will, and I see that you do, and yeah. I, I think that's the point of differentiation. And every person that asks you a question, you can just flip it right back to them. You say, you find the answer, and you'll succeed. Yeah. If I give you the answer, that's exactly what'd you it. learn? Huge. How do you, 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 and it's like sometimes you just can't even teach that stuff. No. No, you People can't. just have to have their own individual wake-up call. It is the human experience. <laughs> Folks, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching, if you're listening to this episode, first and foremost, please give us a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, and your favorite uh, platform that you listen to podcasts on. And, of course, if you like this episode, take a screenshot, share it with me, and tag Sean, tag myself, tag Craig Ballantyne as well, and call him an asshole while you're at it, uh, just for fun, shits and giggles. Of course, as always, tell your mama. See you later. Hey, thanks so much for being here for today's Empire Podcast Show. We would love for you to do a quick little favor for us. Just go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating, leave a comment, share it with your friends, and if you're interested in growing your business faster, go to bedroscoolian.com forward slash empire, fill out the application to see if you're a good fit for our Empire Mastermind Group.